Greetings, and welcome to the Injunctive Relief for Standard Essential Patents webinar. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A brief question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. It is now my pleasure to introduce your host, Andrew Kapsidis for Fish and Richardson. Thank you, sir. You may begin. Thank you. And hello, everybody. Um, this is Andrew Kapsidis from Fish and Richardson. Thank you for joining us today for uh, Fish and Richardson's Insights Litigation Webinar Series. Um, today, uh, my colleague David Healy and I will discuss injunctive relief for standard essential patents. Both Dave and I are principals at Fish and Richardson. Uh, to learn more about us, uh, feel free to read through our biographies uh, on the screen, or, or uh, you can visit our website at www.fr.com to look us up. For those of you who are joining an Insights webinar for the first time, this webinar series explores cases and trends in a variety of forms and provides perspectives about key legal developments and litigation strategies. Attorneys from Fish's intellectual property, commercial, and white-collar litigation practice areas will participate in Insights, so you will have the chance to experience the breadth of our litigation practice. We are excited to have you join us today and want to invite you to mark your calendars for our next meeting on December 4th when we will discuss the continuing evolution of patent damages. This is outside our normal webinar schedule for the third Wednesday of, of the month, but we wanted to take into account the busy holiday season. The webinar will feature my colleagues and authors of the well-known blog, Patent Damages, Chris Marques and Justin Barnes, both principals at Fish & Richardson. Today's webinar is scheduled to run for one hour and will include a question and answer period at the end of the program. You can ask questions at any time throughout the program by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to submit your question. We, we will try our best to answer them all at the end of the program, time permitting, uh, but in case we don't get to anybody's questions, pl please feel free to contact us individually after the webinar. Um, I should also add that uh, this presentation is for educational purposes and discussion only and doesn't necessarily reflect the opinions of other attorneys or, uh, or Fish and Richardson. So with that being said, uh, let's jump in. As I'm sure everyone is aware, standards and standards bodies uh, play a, a very important role in advancing technology in most industries, particularly industries where interoperability is a critical uh, requirement. Um, the recent smartphone wars that have been going on over the last few years have put a particular spotlight on SEPs, or standard essential patents, and also on the, the terms under which members of standard setting bodies uh, and patent owners agree to license their patents, otherwise known as FRAND, or Fair, Reasonable, and Non-Discriminatory uh, Licensing Terms. So there are a number of issues that courts and, and government agencies are currently struggling with uh, when it comes to SEPs. And the first is, perhaps the most obvious, is what, is, what constitutes fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory licensing terms? How are those determined? Um, and, and how are they adjusted based on factors such as the relative importance of a patent to a particular standard? or the particular relationship of the patent holder to a given licensee. It should be noted that uh, FRAND terms doesn't necessarily mean equal or identical terms between licensees. It only means that they are fair and reasonable given the particular relationship uh, between the, the patentee and the licensee. Um, other issues that uh, courts and, and government agencies are currently struggling with is the availability of injunctive relief in cases of infringement. Uh, in what instances is an injunction available when the patentee is already committed to license its patent on brand terms? Also, what remedies uh, are available for an accused infringer, such as uh, an injunction, when the patent being asserted is encumbered, if you will, 
by an obligation to license on FRAND terms. So these are some of the issues along with uh, potential damages for refusing to license uh, that play on both sides of the V, if you will, uh, for plaintiffs and defendants. Uh, what I've included here on the next slide is uh, a, a graphic that most of you have probably seen before. It's an illustration. This one, this version is a, a little bit uh, outdated, but it, it just gives you an idea of what the current uh, smartphone competitor patent suits landscape looks like and, and gives you some indication of why this issue of SCPs and, and FRAN terms has become so important lately. Dave? I'm going to talk uh, about what FRAND means. And reasonable tends to be a function of what you think is reasonable. And what you think is reasonable generally depends on where you sit, whether you're the patentee, the accused infringer, um, whether you're a large company or a small company. But the theory behind FRAND is that a patent or a technology should not be enhanced in value nor really diminished in value because a group of competitors got together in a room and decided to make it the standard so that their products would be interoperable. You know, generally when competitors get together in a room and the results of whatever they do limits production or raises prices, somebody goes to jail. Uh, that doesn't happen in standard setting because this is viewed as a pro-competitive activity. And the idea of the reasonable royalty is one that's in most standard setting groups rules, but really is grounded in antitrust law. And it, in effect, means that you're not getting more or less than what you would have gotten in a world where your patent or your technology had not been adopted as the standard. Um, there's also a problem in standard setting royalties because you typically have lots and lots of people who declare lots and lots of patents as standard essential. And that results in this issue of how, you know, how would you possibly pay royalties if all of these patents are standard essential. Standard setting groups are not in the business of deciding what patents are actually standard essential. They're asking for patent owners to put it out there on the table so that people know what their claims are before the standard is implemented. The royalty stacking is something that has to be taken into account in determining a reasonable royalty because in this regard we're now looking at it from another perspective that again comes out of antitrust principles and that is we let this group of competitors get together and decide on what's going to be manufactured and in effect that's going to drive the price because it makes more products available to more people at better prices. And if the royalty burden becomes so onerous that that purpose is not served, that it's not met, then the antitrust laws are going to find a problem with what's happening with the standard setting process. And so royalty stacking has to be looked at in the context of not just maintaining a level playing field among competitors, but also promoting the goal of more products at better prices for more people. And it frankly boils down to, you know, a fact issue of how many people are asking for royalties, how much are they asking for. In the early days of uh, Etsy with the 3G standard, for example, there was a movement by several large uh, phone manufacturers to have a rule adopted that the cumulative royalty could not be more than 5% when it's all added together. Other people said 10% or 12%, but there was always an understanding that it would be 
some small uh, percentage of the product price that would have to be divided among the standard essential patent holders. Uh, recent cases. We've had this brand issue uh, and what is brand and you know how do you calculate it for well over a decade. And there's been litigation over it for well over a decade and cases that have literally settled as the jury was going to be put into the box. Basically, no one wanted a judge or a jury to decide the royalty rate. Uh, the business ramifications were too important. They were seen as too difficult. And people ultimately felt they had a gun to their head on both sides when you actually got down to trial. And so while this issue had been teed up for trial many times, and in fact had been tried uh, in at least one ITC case I know of five years ago, the parties have, had never let anyone in a court or a jury or the ITC actually decide it. And we did have an FTC interim decision in the Rambus case some years ago, but the first court that really decided it was the uh, Microsoft Motorola case in April. And there, Judge Robard wrote a very extensive 207-page brand analysis based on a modified Georgia Pacific analysis focusing on the contribution of the patents to the standard and the pre-standardization value of the patents and looking at comparables um, from other patent licensors, in particular a pool, for a FRAN royalty determination. In September, Judge Holderman, the chief judge of the Northern District of Illinois, who is very um, uh, interested in patent matters, uh, wrote the local patent rules there. He also determined the FRAN royalty. He significantly did two things that have been open subjects of debate, and that's whether you treat optional standards the same as mandatory standards, and he treated them the same, and then whether or not essential means there's no other technical solution, period, or that there's no other commercially feasible solution. And he held that it was no other commercially or technically feasible solution than the standard, which when you're talking about interoperability and the goals of standard setting and the lens of antitrust that we look at all this through makes sense. Um, he ultimately followed Judge Robar's analysis in applying a royalty to what is the prevailing view from the Federal Circuit in Laser Dynamics, uh, the smallest infringing unit, which was the chip, not the system. I'm going to go ahead and move on to uh, Hynix versus Rambus is a little different. Um, I think when I first was involved in this litigation, was three years before my college freshman was born. Um, ultimately, in May, Judge White uh, put a FRAN rate down as a penalty for spoliation on remand from the Federal Circuit. And basically, he made it the rate that's in other uh, Rambus licenses. What's interesting about what he did, though, was he went off of the effective royalty rate, not the stated rate. The real money, not the play money. Another recent case that is very interesting, also from Judge White from last May, is he gave a preliminary injunction against someone who had committed to the license on FRAN terms from enforcing an exclusion order if the ITC issued one. So here, someone went to court proactively and got an injunction that would bar the implementation of an exclusion order that might later issue from an ITC proceeding. Uh, recently, 
Judge Davis did a pretty good summary of the current case law in Fran in the Erickson versus Steeling case. Uh, the consensus seems to be that the opening offer by each side need not be Fran, but you have to have good faith negotiations, and ultimately you've got to have a Fran offer, and that royalty stacking is a fact issue. Later on, we'll talk about Microsoft versus Motorola, where damages were actually awarded based on the patent owner not honoring their duty of good faith and fair dealing. Um, Andy? Thanks, Dave. Um, so if we, uh, if we take a summary look at the cases um, that Dave just discussed um, and, and what the ultimate outcome was for these as concerns injunctive relief, um, there's, there's a bit of a trend that emerges. Uh, so first, in, in Microsoft, Innovatio, and Hynix, uh, there was no injunction issued against the accused infringer, and the court set a Frand rate. Uh, in Realtek, there was no injunction to Realtek, who was the accused infringer, but an injunction actually is, issued to the SEP holders. And then in Ericsson, again, no injunction issued to the accused infringer. And there the court declined to set a frange rate uh, because for some reason the defendant would not agree to be bound by it. And thus they, they ended up having a jury decision on damages, which in effect became the frange rate there. So if we look at trends, if you will, that, that you can glean from uh, you know, this, this admittedly small sampling of cases, um, what we're seeing is it looks like district courts are disinclined generally to enter injunctions against parties accused of infringing an SCP, and they're taking seriously the obligation of the patent holder uh, and the accused infringer to negotiate FRAN terms in good faith. Uh, it, it seems to be that uh, you really have to show the willingness to negotiate for and terms in good faith, uh, whether you are the, the, the SCP holder or the accused infringer. Um, it, it also seems that courts are generally looking at these Fran scenarios uh, as perhaps a vehicle to settlement uh, where they can essentially force parties into uh, discussions about what the Fran terms will be, and those end up being de facto settlement talks. Now, if we turn to the ITC in particular, uh, first I should point out that the ITC's governing statute, Section 337, does recognize equitable estoppel-based defenses. Um, and as such, at least in theory, recognizes the equitable, the defense to infringement of equitable estoppel based on a duty to negotiate FRAND terms, FRAND licensing. Uh, in the recent Samsung versus Apple case um, in June of 2013, the ITC held that Apple's Fran defense would not block an exclusion order. So an exclude, and, and then went on to actually issue uh, both exclusion and cease and desist orders to Apple based on its finding of infringements uh, of certain claims and certain patents in that case. Uh, notably, the ITC did not follow what were at the time stated positions from both the DOJ and the FTC, uh, and in fact the PTO as well, uh, or any of the district court opinions that Dave discussed. Uh, so the, the ITC just went its own way and basically adhered to the Section 337 statute, uh, which says in essence when there is a finding of infringement, uh, the commission shall issue an exclusion order. Uh, what is notable, what is particularly noticeable about this case, because this was not the first time that the ITC had been faced with a Fran defense um, and had denied it. Um, the, what is particularly noticeable is that the president, during the presidential review period, which is the 60 days that extends after the commission's final determination, um, the president, through the United States Trade Representative, 
rejected the exclusion order. So I'll talk about more on that in a moment because that was that was truly a significant event uh, in the sense that it um, is extremely rare. Uh, I should add that uh, given the ITC's actions, uh, not just in the Samsung Apple case, but previously um, with not accepting Fran defenses historically. Um, that and, and also that has inspired several legislative proposals, um, none of which have come to fruition yet, but are in various stages of, of being considered by Congress. Um, one of those is the um, uh, the proposal that the ITC consider the eBay factors before it issues any exclusion order. Um, this is an issue that is tr traditionally been dealt with in the context of it's been viewed as an issue for um, non-practicing entities and a way to deal with non-practicing entities or patent assertion entities who come to the ITC. But it has also been raised in the FRAN context for standard essential patents as one way for the ITC to consider the value of standards essential patents before uh, it goes off and issues exclusion orders. Um, along the lines of legislative initiatives, um, last summer, summer of 2012, both the House and Senate Judiciary Committees considered not just the, the issue of whether the ITC should adopt the eBay factors for injunctions, uh, but also it, it, they took up the issue of to what extent members of standard setting bodies um, can actually seek exclusion orders once their patents are under FRAND obligations. Uh, hearings were held, the FTC testified there, and the, the crux of the FTC's testimony was that uh, absent exceptional circumstances, um, such as where the accused infringer simply refuses to take a license or they are um, uh, a foreign respondent which cannot be, uh, for which damages can't be obtained against. Uh, barring that kind of exceptional circumstances, the FTC took the position that there, the ITC should not issue exclusion orders against um, parties who are willing to enter into friend negotiations. Um, it's noticeable, uh, notable that the ITC was not present at those hearings and so offered no, no position of its own. Um, more recently, that was last summer, this past summer, uh, the President, the White House, put out a list of legislative recommendations concerning uh, high-tech patent issues. And among those was uh, the President's legislative recommendation that the, um, there be a change in the ITC standard for injunctions to better align it with the, the traditional four-factor eBay test. Um, so there we have the President himself, the White House, coming out and saying that, that this is a legislative recommendation regarding the ITC that Congress should take up. Um, as far as uh, what Congress is actually doing, um, there is a bill right now uh, in the House of Representatives, H.R. 3309, uh, sponsored by uh, Chairman Goodlatte of the uh, House Judiciary Committee, uh, that seems to be the only bill that might possibly address these issues that's currently um, being considered. And, and in fact, that's in committee markup today as we speak. Um, but it seems like the latest version of that does not include any proposals regarding the ITC, whether it's uh, for them to consider eBay um, or uh, basically any other issues concerning the ITC. Um, or standards bodies in, in general. So uh, there doesn't seem to be any legislative initiatives immediately on the horizon um, for that. So the open issue that we have then in ITC jurisprudence is to what extent is the Fran defense viable um, and to what extent can the ITC uh, make determinations regarding FRAND rates when the FRAND rate is either unclear or not agreed upon. Does the ITC actually have authority to make fact findings regarding um, that would support a FRAND rate?
So if we take a look at what uh, government agencies are doing right now, I think the most notable thing is the um, policy statement that was issued by the Department of Justice and the Patent Office jointly back in January, uh, and I provided the URL link here. Um, this policy statement was noticeable, notable because it particularly addressed the ITC and how the ITC deals with uh, exclusion orders in cases of SEPs. Um, and what it's worth a read, and what the DOJ and PTO essentially said was that the governing statute for the ITC, Section 337, requires the ITC to consider public interest uh, before issuing any limited or general exclusion order. Even in the case, uh, even in the case where there has been found infringement, uh, it's still under an obligation the ITC is to consider public interest. So what the DOJ and the PTO came out and said is that the public interest very well may counsel against issuing an exclusion order, depending on the specific circumstances. And while, while an exclusion order for infringement of SEPs may be appropriate in some instances, uh, the public interest could very well preclude issuance of exclusion orders and cease and desist orders uh, where the infringer is essentially willing to negotiate under FRAN terms um, and has not refused to enter into such negotiations and when the patent holder is also willing. So what, what seems to be key there is a demonstrable willingness to negotiate in good faith uh, by both parties. And then the DOJ and the PTO went on to state that the ITC should give serious consideration to public interest. Um, I have block quoted here exactly what they said because it's, it, it, it's unusually strong language from, in my opinion, from one government agency speaking to another. But what they're telling the, uh, the ITC is that public interest factors are not meant to be given lip service. Rather, the public uh, health and welfare and the assurance of competitive conditions in the United States economy must be the overriding considerations in the administration of Section 337. So, um, like I said, unusually strong language from the DOJ and PTO essentially telling the ITC uh, how to interpret its governing statute. Okay, so um, I, I've thrown this slide in. My guess is that nobody online um, knows who this gentleman is, at least at the moment, um, but may soon. Uh, he is United States Trade Representative Michael Froman, and um, what he did is uh, he essentially did something that's only been done three times before in the history of the ITC and only once since 1987 and may, may is the operative word, affect a change of policy at the ITC. So following the decision by the ITC to issue an exclusion order against Apple in the 794 investigation, exclusion and cease and desist orders, uh, it went up for presidential review that presidential review is delegated to the U.S. Trade Representative, um, in this case, uh, Ambassador Froman. And what he did was he issued a letter rejecting the, uh, the ITC's issuance of those orders. Um, the letter itself is dated August 3rd, 2013. Um, and in it, he uh, relies extensively on that DOJ PTO policy statement. Uh, he states that the administration um, has made a decision based on policy considerations as they relate to competitive conditions in the U.S. economy uh, and upon U.S. consumers. And then he went on to instruct the ITC to, uh, first of all, carefully consider public interest issues at the outset of an investigation and have the parties develop a factual record regarding standards, standards essential nature of patents, uh, whether that's a contested issue and whether there's any patent holdup or reverse holdup going on, meaning whether the patentee is unwilling to license or whether the accused infringer is unwilling to negotiate on FRAN terms. Um, and then he goes on to recognize that an exclusion order may still be appropriate, um, but under 
uh, under limited circumstances, for example, where the patentee refuses to li- where the, the accused infringer refuses to license. Um, uh, he does state that that's a non-exclusive list, but those are the only two um, the only two instances that are pointed out of, of where an exclusion order may be appropriate is where the accused infringer refuses to take a FRAND license or negotiate, or where you're talking about a foreign respondent uh, who cannot uh, be amenable to jurisdiction in a U.S. court for damages. So, uh, now Dave is going to talk a, a bit about the FTC and some, some EU uh, SCP settlements, which uh, uh, show sort of where some of the trends are going in this area. Thank you, Andy. And, and let me just add a quick comment here that there are a series of speeches from different Department of Justice officials and FTC officials that go back about a year and a half that talk about this whole problem, um, and there is a Justice Department official who gave a speech to a United Nations group that was specifically delegated to look at it. So this is policy that's been evolving, and you know I kind of view the 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 exceptions when you know uh, injunctions available. You know there are some realistic circumstances. Um, but anybody who's too dumb to make a record that they were negotiating in good faith probably deserves what they get. Um, that's just one of those things that anybody who's, who's intelligent ought to be able to put, avoid that trap. Um, one thing that we do see in terms of a framework that law enforcement has approved, and these are negotiations that came out of investigations with the FTC and the European Commission involving, quote, abusive standards, or where there was a a problem, for example, in the Bosch case, where there was a merger, and as a condition of a merger approval, the FTC wanted to cure complaints about the company that was being acquired and how they had handled their standards essential patents. They're not binding on anyone but the parties. They're not precedent, but they're things that people can look at as examples. There's a little twist when you talk about the European Union and telecom because most of the standard setting obligations that people discuss in telecom come from the European Telecommunications Standards Institute, which is ETSI. And what people may or may not realize is that ETSI is actually part of the European Union government. And the European Commission has authority over ETSI, and there is even a provision in the ETSI licensing rules that if somebody doesn't play nice that Etsy can report them to the European Commission. So in Europe, an EU settlement involving telecommunications may have a little bit more oomph than a settlement in the US with the FTC or even a settlement in the EU in an area that's not under the direct control of the European Union government. But basically, these are structured along the lines of you've got to engage in good faith negotiation uh, for some period of time, and then if you can't reach a consensus, you can arbitrate. Um, The FTC decree in uh, Google and remote Rolla mobility is broader really than the EU decree that's been put out there than the Samsung, uh, in the Samsung case. The EU's caught a lot of flack over that decree, so we'll see how that 
shapes up in the end. Um, but these are ways that you can look at how you should approach the issue. And the arbitration element reflects the view that the Justice Department and the FTC have been talking about in speeches for quite a while, and that is that nobody should be enjoined unless a court has finally resolved or some other neutral body has finally resolved the FRAND rate and the licensee refuses to accept it. Standard setting groups themselves stay away from rate setting because they don't want to be accused of price fixing. That, you know, that old phobia about going to jail just freaks people out. Now, one interesting development is we've seen remedies for the infringer. So Microsoft versus Motorola, Motorola was actually enjoined by Judge Robard in the Western District of Washington from enforcing an injunction from a German court in Germany on a standards essential patent because they had failed to make a friend offer, breach of the contract. And that was affirmed by the Ninth Circuit. So that's an example of where the courts here are even willing to step over uh, into another country's sovereignty to enforce the contractual brand obligations. And you, know, you could also make arguments even under the Foreign Antitrust Improvements Act that there's an antitrust basis for it as well, but this was a contract basis. Last, uh, well, I guess six weeks ago, Judge Robard upheld a $14.5 million jury verdict for Microsoft, not based on breach of the contract, but based on the breach of the duty of good faith and fair dealing in failing to follow FRAN licensing rules. Uh, that was based on Washington law, and there's always a big question of whose law applies, but more and more we're seeing district judges apply the law of the forum. And, you know, for those of you who are wondering, under Texas law outside the UCC and being a, um insured who's making a claim against their insurance company, there is no duty of good faith and fair dealing. So we're seeing remedies for the infringer when the patent owner doesn't honor the obligation, not just the fact that the patent owner is being denied an injunction. And here I have on slide 19 a uh, little clip from the opinion to show what the duties were that added up to that breach of good faith and fair dealing. And one of those was seeking the injunction itself. So that's really, I think, more than enough uh, that anybody should have to listen to me in one day. Certainly, my wife would think so. And um, Andy, let me turn it back to you. Sure. And let me, um, on that last point, um, let me add one further thing, which is that um, you know, the DOJ has been working with standard setting bodies for, for a little while now, um, it, you know, at least over the past year or so, to help them decide what, uh, you know, how, how well they should articulate FRAN terms uh, as part of their agreements. And there's a, there's a couple noticeable, um, a couple interesting positions that the DOJ has taken, which is, um, first of all, that... Um, Standard setting bodies should make clear that the, the licensing commitments that their members are signing up for extend not just to other members of the standard setting body, uh, but to non-members of the standard setting body who choose to use the, the standard. Um, so there have been traditionally there have been cases in the past where you have fights over, um, you know, did this party that is asserting an equitable defense based on FRAND, were they a member of the standard setting body at the right time and therefore they had uh, reliance uh, per the traditional equitable factors? 
Um, and the DOJ seems to be coming out with the, the fact that, uh, you know, taking the position that reliance is pretty much established by the fact that you choose to implement the standard. And once you choose to go with the standard, you have the right to um, enjoy FRAND licensing terms uh, for any standards patents that you're accused of infringing. Um, so it's becoming uh, more of a right than a defense, in fact. The other um, interesting position that the DOJ has taken um, is that it is, and I can't say it's actually taken a position on this yet, but um, the DOJ is exploring, if you will, uh, whether there is room for uh, liability under Section 2 of the Sherman Act, uh, so antitrust liability, in cases where a holder um, uh, of an SEP um, that is uh, under a duty to license under FRAN terms uh, seeks injunctive relief while that standard is in place. Um, so that is, that is an undecided question, um, but one that the DOJ is looking into. And I wonder, Dave, if you have any thoughts on whether there can be uh, an, an antitrust uh, liability on the part of an SEP holder who, who seeks to uh, assert a Frand encumbered patent. Well, I think there is an antitrust liability, but the big roadblock to an antitrust claim that's based solely on the filing of a lawsuit is the Nora Pennington Doctrine, or as many people know it from uh, the patent copyright IP world, professional real estate investors, which gives you a First Amendment immunity to bring a claim to court. So basing it on the filing of a lawsuit alone, I think would be challenging. I think there would have to be based you know, on the breach of the contract, a combination of other factors, et cetera. You know, one interesting question or two interesting questions that come to mind are, well, before we had all these great standards rules, what happened? And there are cases, for example, an older case that was a district court opinion affirmed by the Federal Circuit, Stambler versus Diebold, where the inventor was aware of what was going on in the standard setting group, had probably attended meetings, and never mentioned his patent, and then he tried to enforce his patent against people in the group, and that resulted in an equitable estoppel uh, against him. And, you know, in some ways, the same would be true if you don't disclose that you will not license on fair and reasonable terms, because that's become everyone's expectation in this industry. And that expectation, as I said, is really grounded in antitrust law as much as or more than the rules. And, and what people have to keep in mind is that it was decided a long time ago by the U.S. Supreme Court when the specific issue came up in the context of a Section 2 case where the defendant argued, look, I followed the standard setting group's rules. You know, I followed the rules, and since I followed the rules, I'm immune from an antitrust suit. And the Supreme Court said, no, you're not. We really don't care what those rules are if, in fact, what you've done is anti-competitive. So these rules from these standard setting groups, they're guides. They're probably extremely persuasive evidence in a Section 1 analysis. Um, on reasonable uh, or unreasonable restraints on competition or whether in a Section 2 analysis you've had a monopolization claim. But, you know, they're not dispositive. And the other thing to remember is if, in your, if you're in Europe, their antitrust law is a little bit different in that they have, um, in most European countries and in the EU um, Treaty of Lisbon, their Section 2, so to speak, encompasses abusive pricing. So 
it's sort of like a duty of good faith and fair dealing in pricing that we don't really have in the U.S. Okay, thanks. Um, we are now um, moving into the Q&A phase. So I have, uh, we've received a number of questions here. And let me remind you, if you have questions to ask, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You just click on that and type it in, and uh, we, will, we will try to get to your question. Um, so let me ask, uh, so the first question I've received um, is, um, and I'll put this one to you, Dave. Um, if, a, if a patentee follows the standards group's licensing rules, does that give it a, uh, immunity from antitrust liability? It, it, yeah, that, that's the point I was just making, Andy, is that the U.S. Supreme Court's previously held that standard setting rules are not a defense to liability. In Europe, you would actually have a better case since, if, if you're in telecom, since Etsy is part of the European Union. Um, but in the U.S., clearly, it's not. Okay. Um, and then, let's see, so the next question I have is, um, now, that the, uh, now that the President has declined one exclusion order, when do you expect the ITC may issue a new opinion concerning a FRAN defense? So on that issue, there are, um, uh, I will tell you there there are currently a number there are currently several cases at the ITC in various stages that are representing the Frand issue. Um, I think the the one that is most far along uh, is likely to have a an initial determination by the ALJ within the next uh, I'd say two to three months. Uh, at that point, you know, obviously it's, no one can say how the AOJ is going to decide the FRAND issue, um, but then it will go on to the commission, which will decide the issue sometime in the spring. So I think that spring is probably the earliest that we will hear the ITC issue, um, you know, take a response, if you will, to the U.S. Trade Representative's position on, uh, on this issue. So, and it will be interesting to see whether whether the ITC comes out and continues to maintain its position or, or if it changes in light of what the President did. So the next question um, that I have received is, um, if a standards group is governed by foreign law, when does foreign law apply and when does U.S. law apply? Dave, do you want to take that one? Sure. That has become an oddball issue. You know, as I say, people have been litigating this for a decade um, and at least eight years in the telecom area. And traditionally what you would see in cases brought under the Etsy rules, which state they're governed by French law, were affidavits and um, even testimony from French law professors or French lawyers proving up what French law was because first there was an issue as to whether or not the standards group's rules actually constituted a contract under French law and then there was an issue as to what the brand obligation was under French law but in the opinions we've seen issue out of district courts that are dealing with FRAND, we're typically seeing the district judge apply the law of the forum state. Um, judge Robart applying Washington law, of course Microsoft being resident there. Um, I believe in, a, in a one case Judge Crabb applied Wisconsin law. So it appears that the district judges want to apply the law of the forum in theory, you know, if you're interpreting Etsy rules as a contract, which in Broadcom versus Qualcomm, 
the Third Circuit held that you know, it was an enforceable obligation. In theory, you would think French law would apply if people prove it up, but it could be that um, there's not enough difference once you get over the hump of is it a contract or not, and now it's pretty well respected that it is. But once you get over that hump, there's not enough of a difference that it's worth it. You know, it, oddly enough, in a place like Texas, it could be a difference since we don't have a duty of good faith and fair dealing here. Okay, thank you for that. Um, let's see, it appears we have no further questions at this time. Um, so, uh, so I guess we can we can wrap things up a bit early. Um, thank you all for attending the webinar. Um, you are always welcome to contact me or Dave personally uh, if you have any questions uh, following today's webinar. Um, the audio and materials um, from today's session will be posted within the next uh, 48 hours, I believe, to the webinar page at fishlitigationblog.com. That's fishlitigationblog.com. Feel free to refer to those uh, materials online, or if any of your uh, colleagues or coworkers from your organizations could not attend today, uh, feel, please feel free to, have, to refer them to our blog where they can access the materials. Uh, if you have any questions regarding CLE credit, please email Ellen at the email address on the screen. For those of you in New York, please make note of course code number 220 and include it in your NYCLE form. That will be forwarded in follow-up email. Uh, as a reminder, that code is only applicable for New York attorneys. And finally, please remember to register for our next webinar, The Continuing Evolution of Patent Damages, scheduled for December 4th. Uh, and you can do so by visiting fishlitigationblog.com. Thank you all, and see you next month.